All those who are able, please stand and join in the call to worship. God, you have brought us out into a sacred place. We come as brothers and sisters in Christ. We come to worship you with open hearts and minds. Will you join me in the unison prayer? Holy God, as we reflect on the mysteries and miracles of your presence with us and among us, anchor us in your love, ground us in your peace, and open us to the truth and the comfort of your Holy Spirit, today and always. Amen. And let us join together proclaiming our faith from the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy universal Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. peace of God be with you. Please welcome one another. Go ahead.
Good morning. Um, I would like you to look in your bulletin. You should have an insert in there that's titled A Prayer for Our Time. And it will show you three verses, um, two of which the choir will be singing. But I would like you all to join us on the third verse. Um, the words to this song are wonderful, um, a better time to do it than today to remember all of those people that we have lost in many, many past years. So there's kind of a, a piano interlude when the third verse starts, and I'll turn around and acknowledge you, but I, we really would like you to join us on verse 3. Thank you, Barbara. Our scripture reading is from the Old Testament, Psalm 66, 8 through 20. Praise God, all nations. Let us your praise be heard. He has kept us alive, and 
and has not allowed us to fall. You have put us to the test, God, as silver is purified by the fire, so have you tested us. You let us fall into a trap and place heavy burdens upon our back. You let our enemies trample us when we went through the fire and flood, but now you have brought us to a place of safety. I will bring burnt offerings to your house. I will offer what I have promised. I will give you what I said when I, would, when I was in trouble. I will offer sheep to be burnt on the altar. I will sacrifice bulls and goats. The smoke will go up to the sky. Come and listen, all who honor God. I will tell you what he has done for me. I cried to him for help. I praised him with songs. If I ignored my sins, the Lord would not have listened to me. But God has indeed heard me. He has listened to my prayer. I praise God because all he did, because he did not reject my prayers or keep back his constant love for me. The New Testament reading is from Acts 17, to 31. Paul stood up in the, in the front of the city council and said, I see that every day you Antians are very religious. For as I walked through the city, I looked through the places where you worship. I found an altar which on it was written, To an unknown God, that which you worship then, even though you do not know, know it, it is what I now proclaim to you. God is who made the world and everything in it. The Lord is, heaven, is the Lord heaven and earth and does not live in temples made by human hands. Nor does he need anything that we can supply for, by working for him, since he is indeed who gives the life and breath and everything else to everyone. From one human being, he has created all the races of people, has made them live throughout the whole earth. He himself fixed beforehand the exact times and the limits and places where they would live. He did this so that they can, would not look for him, perhaps find him, as they, felt around, as they felt around him. Yet God is actually not far from any one of us. As someone has said, in him we live, move and exist. It is for some of your poets have said, we t too are his children. Since we are God's children, we should not Suppose that the, this nature is anything like the image of gold and silver or stone shaped by human art or skills. God has overlooked the times when people did not know him, but now he commands all of them everywhere to turn away from their evil ways. For he has fixed the day in which he will judge the whole world with justice by the means of a man he has cho chosen. He has given proof to this from to everyone by raising that man from death. The gospel reading is from John chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. John chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. Hear the word of the Lord. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper who will stay with you forever. He is the Spirit who reveals the truth about God. The world cannot receive him because it cannot see him or know him, but you know him because he remains with you and is in you. When I go, you will not be left alone. I will come back to you. In a little while, the world will see me no more, but you will see me. And because I live, you will live also. When that day comes, you will know that I am in my Father and that you are in me, just as I am in you. Whoever accepts my commandments and obeys them is the one who loves me. My Father will love whoever loves me, and I too will love him and reveal myself to him. These are the blessed words of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Thanks be to God.
Is it working? There it is. Okay. <laughs> when we have a holiday weekend and it's just us few little kids here, us. Yeah, I'm a kid too. You don't believe me, do you? I can see that on your face. You know, up here we're still kids, even though we get gray hair. Yeah, as you grow older, you still think you're a kid up here. Right? Right? You know what Memorial Day is about? What's it about? Well, veterans, the veterans have their own day, though. That's right, those who died. Those who, when they were fighting in a war, died. And what we remember on Memorial Day is that those people actually went into a battle and they got hurt and they died and we, we, we mourn their death, we, we cry about it and we think about how sad it is that they, that they died. Many people over the course of our country's history have died in battle, many men and women. And they did that so that we could do what we're doing right now. Did you know that? If they hadn't died for our country, then we couldn't sit here, possibly, as free as we are to talk about God and to be the country that we are. Uh, there might, things would be a whole lot different, maybe, if, if they had not died. And so what we say is the freedoms that we have have a cost that goes with them. And the cost is that sometimes we're put in a position where wars happen and we really don't want them to happen, but sometimes they do. And when they happen, some people get hurt and they die. So, in our country, it's kind of like we begin thinking is that, you know, Memorial Day is the beginning of picnic season and all that stuff and, and fun. And I've heard people say, have a happy Memorial Day. But when you're talking about people who died, does that make sense? To have a happy Memorial Day? Have a good Memorial Day, that's fine. But when you have Memorial Day, you should think about those who died so that you could have your picnic and nobody would stop you. Yeah. Adults are getting the message too out here too. You know, they're hearing what I'm saying. We got to remember all those who died. Now the song that the choir sang was about when the airplanes came into the big center in New York City. You've seen probably on the news it happened before most of you were born. In fact, before all of you were born, probably, how, old, how old are you on the end? Huh? 12. Yeah, you were, you were, yeah. No, you weren't here yet. Were you here yet? I'm doing, I'm doing my math, but that was after it happened. Was it? Okay. He was four weeks old? <laughs> I'm trying to do the math here. <laughs> So with those folks who died in the, in the plane crash, the, when the plane hit the buildings, those folks gave their lives too for our country. So we want to remember all those who gave their lives so that we might be free and we might rejoice in the church and we might sing hymns and we might come to Sunday school and, and we might do all the things that we do. We, we want to think about them. So do you think maybe we should pray and think about them? Let's have the whole congregation pray with us, okay? Oh God... We, your children, are here remembering those who, in the wars that had to be fought so that this country might be the country it is, we remember those who died. We know in some of our families we have grandmas and grandpas and great-grandmas and grandpas who died in the wars. Some who have brothers and sisters in the, in the room have brothers and sisters who died in the wars. And we know we hate war. We hope that we never have to fight any more of them. We pray, God, that there would be peace, that there'd be no reason why any of our people would ever have to go into battle again. But we know how the world acts and how it thinks, and sometimes it doesn't think the same way you do. So we seek your forgiveness, and we ask, God, that we'd be shown a better way. Be with those who serve our country, and particularly those who died in its service. May they have a special place in your heaven. We pray that as your children sitting on this step, in the name of Jesus, amen. Well, thanks for coming up. And I think there's some coloring things right there you can take, right there in that first pew, some stuff you can take with you.
Well, I have some good news to share with you. Um, there's a thing called the Tom Payton Award that the conference gives every year to a church in the conference that they feel has done the most to help touch on the issues of disability. And um, Carolyn uh, Garrison, our administrative assistant, nominated our church to be considered for that award, and guess what? We're getting it. And we're getting it because we put in the chairlift, we're getting it because of our new signage, and we're getting it because uh, our entryways are more, are more uh, safe for those with disabilities. And the last time we got it, we got it before. This is the second time for us. We got it when you, when you built the uh, Elevette, and I forgot what year it was. It was like 1979 or something along that range, somewhere in there. So this is going to be the second time around that we get this award, and it'll be given to our congregation on the 14th of June at the annual meeting of the Ohio Conference. So we'll celebrate that. Uh, we've done something good and it's been noticed and, uh, and our church is gonna be the recipient of that. Also too, I wanna just say to the Bible study group, I'd like to meet at 10 o'clock on Wednesday, 10 o'clock instead of 10.30. And it's because I have uh, Dick Dickey's uh, funeral at, 10, at 11.30. So if you would um, please join me at 10 o'clock, we'll have Bible study then. I hope what I have to say today will bless you and strengthen you in your faith, encourage you in your journey through life. You know, it's believed that humans learn at least 50% of all that we will ever need to know by the time we're three years of age. 50% of what you need to know to live life. If that's true, it's important that parents give their children's development a lot of attention. They will need a base upon which they can build their lives. The base upon which one's life is built then does make the difference in how well a person is able to live his or her life. From the beginning, every day counts. Every day counts. And from the beginning, every action has an impact. So what we do to our children is important. Faith, then, based in hope, is something that they need to know about. Faith based in hope is very important. Faith has a beginning when a person chooses to believe in God. And how that begin is, it, beginning is expressed or how it happens, however, in diff, it happens in different ways for different people. Some people grow up just knowing and accepting God through Jesus Christ because they were taught by their parents, they were taught by their family, their, their parents brought them to church, and they just grow up knowing Christ is Lord. And that probably happened for many of you. Others encounter the question of whom Jesus is, and as a result decide what meaning he will have in their lives. Decades later, you know, and they think about it, and maybe they make a decision, okay, yeah, yeah, I guess he is the son of God, I can go with that, that's okay. Yeah, I believe in him. And then, for others, there comes a moment in time when something finally kicks in and becomes like a catalytic converter, you know, bang, it hits them. It could be a word, it could be a sermon, it could be a catastrophic event, and suddenly, these people become what they call saved. All these beginnings of faith are, in my opinion, equally valid. You don't have to come one way or the other. The question is, do you believe? No one way of encountering Jesus Christ in life's journey is the only way. However, by any way, the base upon which one builds is the hope that is found in Jesus Christ, the Savior, the hope that is found in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hope then is possible for those who believe they don't need God, Hope is possible for those being persecuted for their beliefs, and hope is even possible for those who feel totally abandoned and helpless. And that's what I'm going to speak to a little bit. At some point in time, we all have experienced people who are absolutely convinced that their truth, life as they perceive it, is the only truth. You've run into people like that. I have too. Well, St. Paul was in Athens, meeting with the intellectuals of Athens, of Greece. 
Greek intellectuals in that time loved to hear about new ideas. They loved to talk about new philosophies. So Paul had been invited to talk about his beliefs. And as he walked to the meeting, he noticed that the Athenians had many statues representing many different kinds of gods, you know. They had a god for this and a god for that and a god for this and a god for that. And you've probably studied them in Greek mythology and all of that kind of stuff. But one statue intrigued the apostle. Paul noticed that it was dedicated to the unknown God. So what they were saying was, oh, we got all these gods, but you know, just in case, there just might be another God out there. We're going to put up a statue to that one so that God doesn't feel slighted. And that's what they had. They had a, a statue to the unknown God. Paul realized it was that moment that gave him common ground where he could stand with the Athenian intellectuals. And so he said to them, <clears throat> I look carefully at the objects that you worship, and I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. Well, folks, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made this world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth does not live in shrines in him we live we move and have our being then Paul shared with them how Jesus had risen from the dead and how some of these Greek intellectuals scoffed and said, silly man that doesn't happen and others said they'd like to listen to Paul another time you come back I want to hear more about this Jesus that you're talking about but, the scripture says, some of them joined him and became believers, including Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris. There is hope for those convinced that their truth is the only truth. You know, they're so closed-minded about everything. You know, what I have to say is the only probable way we could do anything. What I have to believe is the only way you can believe. You've seen people like that. And there's some whose truth, their truth is the only truth, and they're so closed-minded about it. Pontius Pilate, on the night that he dealt with the problem of Jesus, looked around at those who gathered near him, and he asked, truth, what is truth? You see, it's hard to find what the real truth is because we all have our perceptions about truth. And none of us want our perceptions about truth politically, religiously, economically, none of us want that question because that's how we live by, you know, that's the standard I have accepted for my life. And you can't be right because that's what I believe. You've run into people like that. Maybe at times you've even been that way. Your truth is the only truth. The truth is that God loves us all. And that is the truth. And that truth is continuously rediscovered over and over again in Jesus Christ. There's not just some people God loves. There's not just some people God cares about. God cares about every single person. The scripture says God is no respecter of persons. That doesn't mean he doesn't respect us. What it means is God doesn't choose from among us who is the best and who is the worst. We are all God's children. The late aerospace scientist Werner von Braun searched the universe through rocketry to discover and uncover truth. You know, a lot of people say religion and science can't work together. That's hogwash. A lot of what science finds out just simply confirms what the scripture teaches. It does. But Werner von Braun continued to look for the truth in what he was doing and publicly he would always acknowledge all through that search that there is a God who is greater than all there is and who in fact created all of this because that's the only way it could have happened. That's what Werner von Braun would tell you. He headed up the space program years and years ago. Before that, the Nazis used him to do a program trying to build rockets so they could kill people with him. They didn't like that. And he came to America and did something good with it. And he's not the only one. There are lots of scientists who say God is there and God created and God made. There is hope 
for those who think they know the truth more than anybody else. There's hope for them, but not yet found, and have not yet found the real truth is in Jesus Christ. One day they're going to find that out if they get blessed enough, and they'll realize there's more to God's truth than to my truth. There's also hope for those who know the truth, and because of it, they're persecuted. That's becoming reality again in our country. I've referred to Marion, the woman in Sudan last week, who was sentenced to be hanged. She's a, she married a Christian man, converted to Christianity, became pregnant. She's eight months pregnant. But a Sudanese court sentenced her to death, to hang, for not returning to the faith, for becoming a Christian and ordered her a hundred lashes for committing adultery because her marriage is not recognized by them. And now the outcry is all around the world. There's hope for those who are being persecuted. The early Christians really suffered for their faith. They really suffered. They were beaten. They experienced discrimination and murdered because of their faith. You know, hope doesn't exist unless there is a struggle. Do you hear what I'm saying? Hope comes out of a struggle. It's not hope if you say, I want something. I want a new bicycle for Christmas. That's not hope. That's what you want. Hope is born out of turmoil. Hope is born out of struggle. You don't know how to hope until you felt that in your life. Then that's hope. And hope is the positive outcome of the struggle. The New Testament was written for the people in the early church. It was written for the people in the early church who were living in fear for their lives because they followed Jesus. And today we worry about, oh God, will this worship service go longer than an hour? That's what we worry about. That's the persecution, listening to the sermon that, all that time. When is that guy ever going to shut up? In spite of their persecutions, those early Christians had hope. Hope is born out of struggle, born out of pain. And so it was in the letters from Paul along with those of other apostles and the good news written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that people in the early church were able to live through the pain of their existence and believe in brighter tomorrows and a greater eternity. They found great solace in words such as those spoken by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, because I think he had an idea what was coming. Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There is hope for those who know the truth and are persecuted for it. Remember those words because our days of persecution may yet be coming. You may not believe that, but they may be coming when your life depends on saying, I'm a Christian, like it does for Miriam, Miriam in Sudan. There's great hope for those who feel abandoned. Abandonment is a common feeling. Fed by a sense of helplessness, the one feeling abandoned thinks there is no place to turn, nowhere to go, no one who cares, no hope, and maybe even no God. <clears throat> when my daughter, who, Tammy, who's 42 now, was about four years old, we lived in a parsonage across the parking lot from the church building, and one afternoon, Tammy was asleep, her mother was away, and I was in charge. I needed to go over to the church building for just a few minutes, and I didn't want to wake Tammy from her nap. There's some stuff over there I needed to get. My office was in the parsonage, but the secretary's office was in the church. So I'd walk across the parking lot. 
I was only 200 feet away. She awakened. Then she realized she was alone. Searched the house. Called the police. <laughs> telling them, I'm all alone and my mommy and daddy aren't here. I wasn't gone more than five minutes. She, however, felt abandoned. As I emerged from the church, Tammy ran across the parking lot shouting, Daddy, I thought you were lost. And I was scared. And I called the police. And I cringed. <laughs> Felt awful. Called the police myself and explained what had happened. Our faith proclaims there is hope for those who feel abandoned. Jesus himself proclaimed, I will not leave you orphaned. I will not leave you abandoned. I am coming to you because I live, you will live also. When you feel there's nowhere to turn, when you feel nobody cares, and when you feel like you're having the awfulest day of your life, you're not alone. You're not abandoned. You have this person called Jesus Christ, your Savior, who's watching over you. Our faith proclaims there is hope for those who feel abandoned. We can rely on God to be there for us when the rest of the world has turned its collective backs on us. Now, people in my profession, sometimes we say things that everybody else around us don't believe. My last church, I said some things that got a guy pretty mad at me. He had a few words for me, walked out, stomped out of a meeting. Three years later, his wife was in a grocery store line behind my wife, and she apologized profusely for how he had treated me because he had learned I was right. Sometimes we have to say things that people don't like. Sometimes we have to tell you things you don't want to hear because our job is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comforted. That's what pastors do. And sometimes it seems like the world has turned on you and all you got is God. You probably felt that in your life too. When it seems like your friends don't care, when it feels like nobody else cares, when it feels like your family's just thinking the wrong thoughts. But God is there to support you. God is there to be with you. Indeed, everything has a beginning and everything has an end. Hope, however, born out of struggle, fuels the life lived in between the beginning and the end. Hope fuels that life providing a base from which to move on with each new day. And God is the reason that hope exists. God invented hope. For the people of Athens, the one true God was an unknown God, as their statue said, for whom they continued to search. And that's why they listened to St. Paul. And maybe they listened to a whole bunch of other guys, too, who wanted to talk about that unknown God, but maybe different gods. For others, God is the major truth in their lives. As a testimony to that fact, we need only look at the Roman persecutions of Christians, among whom hope survived and Christianity flourished for, for actually three centuries before the Romans actually said, okay, Christianity's okay, it's good, it's neat, it fits my political agenda, so therefore I'm going to proclaim it as the faith of the nation. But up until that happened with Constantine, it was verboten. And the people died because they believed it. Psychiatrist Viktor Frankl, a victim of Nazi tyranny and imprisonment, in telling how he and others survived their persecutions, when he was asked, how did you survive that? How could you do that? How did you make it through? He always gave a one-word answer. Hope. 
You see, hope is born out of struggle. Remember that. Hope just doesn't happen. Hope comes out of struggle, out of pain. And finally, for those who feel abandoned, hope is real because God does not let us face the struggle alone. God sent God's only Son so that we may know we are not alone in the struggle. No matter what we face, it is our belief based in hope that will see us through. St. Paul wrote a letter to the Roman church, and he said this to them, suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us. Build your life on that base called hope in Jesus Christ. It's found in God through Jesus our Savior, who is the Son of the living God. And what better person could you have faith? Build your hope on the Lord Jesus Christ. Please pray with me. God, creator of all that is, we feel your blessings around us in this world. We know that you are there. We know that in you we can find hope. We pray today for people all around us who are suffering, either because of their political beliefs, their religious beliefs, suffering because they live in a world that is not faithful to you, a world that doesn't care, a world that turns its back on you, God, when you really are the only answer to it all. Forgive us when we have turned our backs on you. Forgive us for forgetting to whom it is that we belong, that being you. Forgive us for not sharing that faith with others. Lord God, we pray that hope would continue to live in our lives. We pray that our lives would be stronger in faith and knowledge of you. We pray that we would be a better people. And so this weekend, as we recall those who have lost their lives in places like Normandy and places like the Mekong Delta and places like uh, Iraq, places like Afghanistan, and places like trenches in France, and board ships in the Pacific and the Atlantic. Lord, we look at those people, the millions of people, millions of people who've lost their lives so that we would be free to sit here today. We think of those millions and we thank you for them. We're sorry that they had to lose their lives because of our mankind's corruptness and insensitivity toward one another. And we're sorry that they lost their lives because there were many maniacs with a maniacal, destructive element inside their souls that wanted them to have power, rule over all people. And yet they still are here, Lord. They're still on the face of this planet. How could it be? Lord, let it not happen anymore. May the strength and the courage of the people overarch all of that pain that's caused by dictators and empire builders. We pray. Bless the souls of those who have died. Bless their families who have lost them. May they feel your love surrounding them. And may we know, God, that in eternity we'll all be together again, praising your name and glorifying you. Watch over us, we pray. Forgive us of our sins and encourage us in our daily living. May we continue to follow you with hope in our hearts. For it is in Jesus' name we pray the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts 
as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. opportunity now to praise God through our giving, reminding you that the gift of your time and your talent is just as important as your gift of money. But all three make things happen here, and all three are a blessing to God, and God receives this blessing from you and returns to you ten times over what you've given. Bless God now with your gifts. We thank you, God, that we are able to give. It is a blessing to be able to support your church, to support the work it does. It's a blessing just to be able to pay the light bills here and just to pay the heating bills and, the, and all the comfort that we have in this building through the gifts that we give. So bless the hands that brought them to these, this place. Bless the homes from which they come. May our families continue to be prosperous as we, as we have been for so long. And may we be blessed with love. May we be blessed with strength and character and faith. May we know, God, that we are serving you, the one true God, whose Son is Jesus, the Savior of all mankind. We pray this prayer with gratitude in our hearts. In the name of that same Jesus, amen.
Just remember those who died when you're cooking your hamburgers. Just remember those who died. And then go on and have a good day. Because they'd want you to celebrate. They'd want you to play. They'd want you to run through the park. They'd want you to be diving in the pool. They'd want you to be playing badminton and volleyball and baseball and all those other things because that's what they died for. so their people could live. So go out and live. Go out and make their lives count. Go with hope in your hearts and faith in your God because they gave you that right. And God will bless you. One day God's face will shine on you and God will grant you peace.